this is exciting for us to be talking about the ear positive metastatic breast cancer and just uh, key insights on LS uh, and the latest uh, in the uh, Emerald uh, subset uh, analysis. Absolutely. Looking forward to the discussion. And so one of the issues that we have right after the patient's cancer is, is progressing on endocrine therapy is endocrine resistance. So once that, that cancer becomes endocrine resistant, then what do we do, right? We have to, we have to kind of look at the mechanism behind endocrine resistance. And one of the, the, the ways to do this is by doing genomic testing, exactly. Say you do genotyping and you find ESR1 mutation, it would signal that it's likely dependent, still dependent on the ER pathway as opposed to some other alteration. So I find that very valuable. But a point I would make is that these are acquired mutations. So it's important to do liquid biopsy or plasma-based genotyping. If we profile the original you know, primary breast cancer or even the biopsy that was done at the time of metastatic diagnosis, you can miss these mutations. So let's say a patient does have a tumor that has now developed an ESR1 mutation. What is your, your go-to strategy after that? Well, we now have an FDA-approved therapy, uh, elacestrant is approved for patients who have detectable ESR1 mutations. And the clinical trial liquid biopsy was used for the detection of ESR1 mutation. So this was based on the Emerald study. The Emerald study demonstrated elacestrant was superior to standard of care endocrine therapy for patients in the second line plus setting. In the Emerald trial, all patients had received prior CDK4-6 inhibitor, about 20% had received prior chemotherapy, 30% um, had received uh, two prior lines of therapy. Overall, there was improvement in progression-free survival with elacestrant was a standard of care in the total population. And if we look at patients with detectable ESR1 mutation, again, there was improvement in progression-free survival with elacestrant was a standard of care endocrine therapy that was uh, clinically meaningful and statistically significant as well with a hazard ratio of 0.55. And since uh, a subset of patients had received prior chemotherapy, the team also looked at progression-free survival in patients who did not receive prior chemotherapy. And in that subgroup, you could see that the median progression-free survival with elacestrant was 5.3 months uh, versus 1.9 months with standard chemotherapy. So in the second line setting where uh, elacestrant is often used, it's helpful to have these data um, in terms of options. And in Virginia, you did some very nice you know, subgroup analyses presented at SABCS. You do want to highlight in terms of what that represents and how the analysis was done and what it means? Yeah, I think our point was exactly that. There was a, a drop in the beginning with many patients probably having endocrine-resistant disease that was not going to respond to any endocrine therapy. And so how do we tease out the patients that still have endocrine-sensitive disease? And so the way we looked at that is we looked at prior duration of a CDK4-6 inhibitor, and we found that if the prior duration of the CDK4-6 inhibitor was at least 12 months, then the, the benefit from elacestrant was clinically meaningful with a median PFS at that point of 8.6 months. So now, interestingly, the standard of care arm, regardless of me what median duration of the prior CDK we looked at, still was at around 1.9 to 2 month median PFS. So that to me tells me if a tumor has an ESR1 mutation, uh, and, and the patient has received already a CDK4-6 inhibitor, which is the majority of these patients, uh, you don't want to give just standard of care endocrine therapy. The, the results are really not, not impressive. You want to do something different. And elacestrin seems to be that. Now, we also looked at a lot of other analyses because we were still trying to tease out patient populations that may not benefit as much from elacestrin or may, may benefit more and so forth. So we looked at patients that had bone metastases versus liver and lung metastases. It really didn't make any difference as long as the prior duration of the CDK was 12 months or more. We looked at co-mutations, PIG3CA, P53, and again, it didn't really ma make, make a difference. Still, there was a nice clinically significant benefit with, with elacestrin looked at HER2 low tumors or not, and we even looked at different ESR1 mutations. And again, it didn't seem to matter. The, the important thing seemed to be the prior duration of the CDK4-6 inhibitor. And also in terms of safety, safety analyses demonstrated that elacestrin has a manageable safety profile similar to endocrine therapies without any of the toxicities that we see with 
PA3 kinase, AKT, mTOR, CDK4, 6 inhibitors. So uh, comparatively, a very uh, manageable safety profile.